Father, as we come now, would you open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things out of your law. More than anything, I pray that we would see the person of your son, Jesus Christ, who is a good and gracious king. He is to be submitted to and to be worshipped and followed and honored and to be in awe of. And I pray that we would. I pray that our children and from their parents and from others would see the beauty of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would minister to us once again. I pray that we would celebrate because we will forever the glory of this King if we are in Christ Jesus. Oh, make that a reality in our lives. Help us now as we worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. Well, we... We gather this morning on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and some of you are anticipating guests and family. Some have already come home at this Thanksgiving time, and some will be coming this week. Look forward to my daughter arriving. This morning, I plan to preach on Christian feasting. That brings us to the subject of food. Do you know that, do you remember that sin entered the world through the eating of food? Remember how Satan tried to destroy Jesus and his rescue work for the world by getting him to make bread and eat food? Food is a good gift from God. It is not evil. But how we view it from a perspective of God is what matters. And the same could be true of all of the good gifts he gives us, whether they be sex or sleep or friendship or so many good physical things in this world. We need to recognize that they are from God and they are sustained through God and they are for God. That's Romans eleven thirty six. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. The things you enjoy, think about them. Whatever you enjoy, do you remember that they're from God? And are you thankful? Have you thanked him? Have you sought to obey what he says about those good gifts? And are you submitting to his instructions? The problem with Adam and Eve is they ate that which was forbidden, even though he gave him a garden full of trees that they could eat. Good gifts become idols when we choose them or another creature and submit to them rather than God. Think about the good gifts God's given you, friends and marriage, family, this church, your food and hobbies. Do you recognize that they are only sustained and enjoyable to you by the grace and power of God? Are you grateful and dependent, trusting and relying why did he give us food, sex, spouse, parents, friends, video games, phones, music, whatever you might add here that can be good at? He gave them to us for him, to glorify him, to enjoy him, to show him off, to experience something about him that we would not otherwise know or enjoy. The problem is all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This should remind us of our need to confess our sins. So if you're able, would you bow your head and would you confess where you have taken good gifts and not thanked him, not trusted him, not pursued his glory. Confess, though, to the Lord. God, there are so many things in which we take you for granted. You provide and provide and provide our very breath this morning, our ability to walk in this room, our ability to sing, our ability to not be terrified of eternal judgment. The food that we'll have this afternoon, the houses we came from, our vehicles, the electricity, sun rising, 
our families, our jobs, our school and education, our technology, including phones and being able to communicate to each other. Oh God, we could just list them all. You are so good to us. And oh God, help us to be grateful. Help us to be submissive. Help us to be dependent. Help us to be focused on why you've given them to us. And oh God, please forgive us that we so often do the things that we ought not to do and we don't do the things we ought to. Oh God, have mercy on us because of Jesus Christ. Make us humble and trusting and happy people in you and you alone. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to God in prayer today. Uh, prayer together, and let's continue to give him our praise as we pray. Our glorious God, we give you praise today. Our hearts are bowed low in awe of your greatness, yet they are lifted up because of your grace and love toward us. Father, we thank you that before the foundation of the world, you chose us in Christ, that we should be holy and blameless before you. In love, you predestined us for adoption to yourself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of your will, to the praise of your glorious grace. So we praise you for your glorious grace, which looked upon the condemned and acquitted us, which looked upon your enemies and made us your friends, which looked upon the cursed ones and blessed us. And looked on those who hated you and you loved us. Father, we thank you for adopting us into your family. We praise you, Jesus Christ, for your heart of oneness with the Father. For those that the Father chose, you would come to redeem. We who were lost, you would travel far to find us. We who were sick with sin, you would be the physician who would heal us. We who were slaves to our sin, you would come and free us. You accomplished all of this through your death on the cross for our sins and your resurrection from the dead. Your blood would cleanse us. Your stripes would heal us and your sorrow would bring us joy. We praise you, Holy Spirit, for applying the work of Christ to our account. It's through you that we could now call God, Abba, Father. It's through you that the character of Christ is being formed in us. It's through you that our lives are now bearing the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of these are foreign to us because of our sin, but you are forming them in us through the work of Christ that you are applying to us. We thank you for making us holy, Holy Spirit, and for keeping us for heaven. So we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, ever three and ever one, for your eternal glory and your unending love for us. We ask today that you would bless the preaching of your word in your gospel today here at Faith and throughout our community. We pray for your churches that they would not put their hopes in human methods or creativity, but in the power of God and in the word of God. We pray that our churches would be like shining cities upon a hill in a world that is darkened by sin and the chaos that sin brings. When hatred is the norm that we see around us, may your church be known for love, love even for our enemies. When evil and sin is glorified, may we display the beauty and the joy of holiness when those around us are lost in darkness and confusion that a Christless life brings, may we lovingly lead them to the light that their souls need, which is Jesus Christ. We pray for those in our midst today that are lost in sin, that you would find them, that you would rescue them, that you would redeem them and bring them to faith and repentance in Jesus Christ. Save them, give them hope in Christ today that their souls need. 
Father, for those who come today rejoicing in your great goodness to them, for those who are experiencing just your manifold blessing and spiritual refreshment or blessing in, in your great provision or uh, new life or birth that's uh, come into their family or uh, just ways that you provided for them in very clear and evident ways and their hearts are just filled with your goodness. God, may they turn that goodness uh, of you to praise to you. For those whose hearts are heavy this morning, we pray that you would lighten their hearts on your strong shoulders, in your good hands, and on the body of Christ that you have given to each of us to bear one another's burdens. So would you minister to those who are hurting and whose hearts are heavy this morning? Father, for those who are struggling and failing against sin, we pray that they would find grace and help today through your word. Father, we pray uh, for our community that Christ would be known and named and glorified and that your churches would be faithful to preach Christ to those who need him. We ask now that as your word is open to us and we look into what your word has to tell us about feasting and Christian feasting, I I ask that you would cause our hearts to to learn. May your spirit illumine us. Uh, our hearts to understand your word and that we would be a rejoicing and feasting people because of your great goodness to us. Would you bless Pastor Daniel? Fill him with your spirit and with power as he brings your word to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn with me to Nehemiah 8, verse 9? Nehemiah 8, verse 9. I'm also going to read from Isaiah 25. I love Thanksgiving season. I love Christmas season. I love the holidays. Sometimes for just non-spiritual reasons, they're, they're just simply fun. And I love them because of the truth that I'm going to share with you this morning. And I pray that I will love them even more and make much of these seasons, and I pray that you will as well. Why do Christ followers feast? That's the question I want to ask, and I want to work with you in thinking about Christian or godly feasting. Nehemiah 8, 9 through 10 In the context of a Jerusalem that was destroyed and is being rebuilt, God's sinful people are brought to exile and then brought back and God is redeeming. He gathers them together and it says in Nehemiah 8 verse 9, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord our God, do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Go your way, eat the fat, drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. One other passage I want to begin with is if you were to turn to Isaiah 25, Isaiah 25, verse 6. Isaiah 25, I'm going to read verses 6 through 9, and I want you to see this great prophecy to God's people. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples... A feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. 
And he, the Lord, will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Last week, we looked at the question, why do Christians fast? For spiritual reasons, they say no temporarily to food and other things in order to seek the Lord. This morning, we ask, why do Christians feast? Sometimes Christians glorify God by not eating. That's what we want to do when we fast. And sometimes they seek to glorify God by eating, feasting. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, what is Christian feasting. And I distinguish this from just general eating. Today you will go home and it may or may not be a feast. Depends on what, how I talk about it this morning and how you seek to apply it. We often eat at least three meals a day. Not everybody does, but we traditionally have three meals a day. That's not what I'm necessarily talking about feasting. In fact, probably if we feast three times a day, you will be a glutton, and you will be too unhealthy. I distinguish this from eating, and yet we find, daily, we find principles about this in our daily eating. I'm talking about a thing called feasting, which I'm going to define in a minute. It's what we should do when we pull up a chair this Thursday afternoon or evening on Thanksgiving or what we will kind of do in a certain way, even though we don't think of it as a feast, this Tuesday night, which I ask all of you to come as we gather in this room and we will do a type of feasting as we remember, and we call it Ebenezer, remembering the faithfulness of God as we look to the future. Or this Christmas season, or Easter, the spring, and we could add each Sunday Lord's Day, as we celebrate this word being given to us and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, what is Christian feasting? Here's a definition that's kind of wordy, but I'm going to break it up, and each word has an intentional purpose to it. What is Christian feasting? Here we go. It's a communal enjoyment in a meal, a meal of celebration for Christ's sake. It's a communal enjoyment in a meal of celebration for Christ's sake. Let me just walk you through that. In one sense, right now, I hope that we are experiencing a communal, each Sunday, a communal together, a community coming together and enjoying a meal of God's word, the bread of life, as we drink upon Jesus, who says, whoever thirsts, let him come to me. We are enjoying a communal meal, celebrating Jesus is Lord. The gospel is true. God is on the throne. He has saved us, and he welcomes his salvation to all, and it's all for Christ's sake. To Christ be the dominion and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So every Sunday, we are Christian feasting in a spiritual sense. Okay, here, let me just break these, these words down here. I, I just hope by the end of this morning, and as you go into the holidays, and as you go into this year, there would be at least an intentionality to glorify God with what you eat and drink, and especially in a, an intentionality of gathering with a type of purpose. Okay, feasting is communal. It's a community affair. A Christian feast is not an individual activity 
where you take a TV tray and by yourself watch some Netflix. And it was a lot of food, so you call it a feast. That's not what feasting is. It's a, a Christian feast. Is an individual, it's not an individual activity, but a communal or corporate joy. It might be your family and an extended family and friends and neighbors and church members. A family feast together along with those they invite. We say, come, join me for my feast, the host would say. A wedding party doesn't sit alone, but calls guests to the party and sings and dances and feasts. A community aspect is critical to feasting. In the Bible, there were three major feasts that Israel was given, one being the feast of the Passover, in which they would gather together, and in many cases, the men of Israel would all go to Jerusalem, usually their whole families, to worship the Lord because of His kindness, because His deliverance, because of His salvation, and because they were marked by God's people, and it included togetherness. That's number one. It's communal. It's corporate. It's community. And then it's feasting is communal, and it's the enjoyment in a meal. Feasting is a community that gathers to enjoy a meal. This Thursday, my family with some of you will sit down at table and will seek to enjoy a meal. I am pretty confident because one of the architects of the meal is my wife. It's going to be an enjoyable meal. Let me focus on enjoyment and meal or food. Feasting is not gathering to eat army rations. It isn't gathering to eat flavorless gruel or fuel. Feasting is the enjoyment of abundance of good food and drink. Food, and we could have a whole sermon on the theology of food. Food is a gift from God. And historically and biblically, the picture of food has regularly been a provision. It has pictured at least two things. God provides and God brings pleasure. God provides when we think of food and sit down, and that's why we should sit down and we should thank God for our food because we go, God, I got to remember you provided for me once again. You did it again. Thank you. You gave me manna. You gave me life. He provides and and food isn't flavorless. Flavorless, It brings pleasure. When you eat your food this week, and I hope every day, think more on what it tells you about the God who gives us food. He gives us food, and he continually gives us provision. We could go to Acts 14, 17, where Paul in preaching, he says, for God didn't leave you people without a witness But he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Psalm 104 rejoices over God's caring providence. So I just, I commend you this Thanksgiving season to read Psalm 104, maybe even together as a family. Psalm 104, let me just, here's a few highlights related to this. You cause the grass to grow. He feeds humans and he feeds animals. It's God that does it. We could go to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. One of the first things he says, I give you good seed and food for your pleasure and for you to eat. Psalm 104, 14, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. Or verse 27 and 28. These, all of God's creatures, will look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they, fill, they are filled with good things. One of the things that God's people gathered was their food, their feasts were often connected to the harvests that took place to God's people. 
and they would praise God, you are my provider. This Thursday, thank God that he is your provider. This afternoon, thank God that he is your provider. And that provider does it with so much goodness and kindness and flavor and grace. God is a God who gives pleasure. God is not pleasure neutral or negative. He loves pleasure. The problem is our hearts are sinful and we make pleasure an idol And it turns into gluttony or sexual promiscuousness. But God is a giver of pleasure and food is an example of it. I thank God for that. God did not make food colorless or flavorless. And he actually could have. He could have just made fuel units for humans to eat. Or we wouldn't even need fuel. He designed it this way. He made it so that we would have our hearts gladdened with joy through food we eat. He made it so that we would delight in the pleasure that it brings. This Thursday, may the turkey and stuffing and cranberries and mashed and sweet potatoes and salads and marshmallow dishes and special breads and appetizers and pies and cakes, the fudge at Christmas, cookies, may they all remind us that God... God's luxurious and abundant care for his, ki- his children. He is no miser when it comes down to food. And he does not spoon our plates with stinginess, but is gracious. And we as Americans can all praise him for the riches he has provided us for. Feasting is the communal. It's an enjoyment of meal. And I want you to see this. A meal of celebration is the third thing. A meal of celebration. In the Bible, we found there's reasons to celebrate. Abraham, when he made treaties with foreign kings, they called a feast. At the weaning of his son, they had a feast to celebrate. At weddings, they had feasts. Jesus, of all the things that he was going to do for his first sign that he is the Son of God, he could have raised somebody from the dead, healed the blind. What would it be that he would choose in order for his first symbolic sign of him, the Messiah, on the scene? He would show up at a wedding party and turn a disaster into a glorious party by turning water into wine because Jesus is the one who has come to bring to his people ultimately festive joy. It is a meal of celebration. God establishes his covenants and they would have feasts to remember them, including the Lord's Supper in which we practiced last Sunday. I thought about changing and having it again this morning. We're gonna do it Tuesday night It is a symbolic feast in which we come together, a community, we eat something, and we celebrate something in Jesus' name. We feast at anniversaries as we remember. So what do we do when we celebrate something? Thursday is Thanksgiving. We are are a meal of celebration, celebrating God's provision and our gratitude towards that. What we do whenever we celebrate, we do a few things. We remember something, we rejoice, and we recommit. We remember, we do some some mental thinking, we remember, we recall. When we celebrate anniversary, we remember that date. A birthday, oh, life that was given in the memories, in the grace of God. And we rejoice, we thank God, and we go, God, help me to do it better. Help me to be more faithful in my marriage. Help me to be more faithful in my life. We, we come this Thursday and we remember all of the blessings. T- Tuesday night, we're going to have rocks at each table or we're going to pick up rocks and we'll write on the rocks and we'll write the different things, that different ways with a Sharpie, the different ways in which God has blessed us. I told somebody, are you coming on Tuesday? And he goes, they don't have a big enough rock for me to tell all the things that God has done. That was my neighbor, Richie. This Christmas, we remember, we celebrate what he has done, and we look to the future. When God's people would gather, they remembered what God had done, 
his faithfulness in dividing the Red Sea, the exodus, the rescue, salvation, his covenant to us, and they would rejoice and praise God that he is faithful. I pray that this Thursday we'll do that. I pray this Christmas season we will set aside times to do that. I pray that we would become a, we would be a feasting people that intentionally do this. This is what God's people do. What does the loving father do in the story of the prodigal? When the prodigal son comes home, he calls a feast. Go kill the fatted calf. Gather the people and let us rejoice because my son was lost, but now he is fine, found. What did the wood widow who lost the coin in that same chapter in Luke he, she calls everybody together, not necessarily to have a food, but says, come, gather, rejoice, I found what was lost. The shepherd who loses the one in 99 finds it and then gathers and says, rejoice with me. God's people were meant to gather and rejoice as they remember, and they do it with food. Okay? So it's a communal enjoyment in a meal, a meal of celebration for Christ's sake, and I say that not just to go, well, you're a Christian, you're a church, you gotta, you got to tag Jesus there. Being together, family, food, friends, rich food, rich drink, the pleasures and provisions of God's care for us, where does it come from? How do children, the Bible says we were children of wrath. How do we get such good care from our Father? How could we, as sit, who are sinners, sit in such a place where a holy God would accept us. And so we can enjoy food and care and pleasures and, and, and not cower and hide behind, behind or from a holy God who could so easily condemn us as guilty. And the answer is God's mercy is in Jesus Christ. Your provision of thanksgiving, anything you thank God for, is because... You get to enjoy them not as pictures of, your, of all that you won't enjoy and you're going to be judged someday, but because God in Christ Jesus has shined his favor upon you if you are a Christian. And if you're not, you're in a whole world of trouble and I invite you to get out of that trouble through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the reason for all rejoicing. Jesus Christ is the reason for all feasting. Jesus Christ is the reason we can sit at a table and enjoy the provision of God and the pleasure of God because you and I deserve the wrath of God, the punishment from God because we sin and violate his law every day of our life and we still keep doing it all of the time. And God made a provision. He provide, provided a way so that we would be rejoined to him by his grace by sending his son in order to be a perfect sacrifice, the lamb of God who is a sacrifice, who is also the food in which we take symbolically in the Lord's Supper that allows us to again sit at God's table. And he says, you brother and sister, yes, you are a sinner, but that's not how I see you now. I see you as my son and daughter. You are my children. Come, welcome eternally and the best is yet to come. When you think, when you eat a meal and think on the nature of food, remember this simple, tr simple truth. My life for your life. I want you to think about that even today as you eat. Everything in that crock pot, everything on that plate, everything related to the food that you have, had to die to give us this food, to give us life. My life for your life. Jesus died to give us life. Jesus died to bring us to the Father. Jesus died to bring us to the fellowship table before God. The Lord's Supper pictures this. Oh, I welcome you to that. Jesus is the fountain of all our blessings, all our feasting, all our celebrating, no matter what it is. All that we enjoy is because of him. The law came through Moses and condemns us. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We were once enemies, but now seated at the table. Jesus, thank you. So with that said, can I, can I give you some, maybe some application and instruction and guidance 
towards feasting this holiday season, four things to give, give attention to based on these things. Four things to give attention to. How should we as Christ followers feast? Number one, we should give attention to others and show love. Give attention to others and show love. Feasting can be good and it can be done really poorly. Proverbs 17 says, better is a dry morsel with a quiet in the house than a house full of feasting with strife. I know that you've experienced some holidays where you go, man, I, pastor, I would like to stay away because it's just strife. Oh, I pray for God will give you help, give you grace. Sometimes there are things that you cannot control and do anything about, but God can help you have a mindset and help your family with that mindset. In 1 Corinthians 11, there was a big problem in the church because they were gathering for the Lord's Supper, and when they would gather, the rich would show up early because they didn't have to work at that time, and they would feast, and they would even get drunk. And then the poor would show up, And they were to have the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, what in the world are you doing? What are you thinking? Don't you know this is the Lord's Supper you're participating in? And the same could be when we feast, we need to give attention to others and show love. Love one another. Would you prepare your thanksgiving by preparing your heart to love your children more? Love your guests more. Love your parents more. Love the, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself and love your enemies and pray for them and bless them. Sometimes we find ourselves through the circumstances that we're in that we have to share a holiday meal with people that feel like your enemies. Oh, may God help you and guide you and direct you to worship him as you come with, armed with paying attention, giving attention to showing them love what does the Bible, what does this, can this also mean? Is you're thinking of a feast, you look around and go, is there somebody I can invite because they don't have somebody to feast with? Look what Jesus said in Luke 14, 12. He said to a man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, let me just add a feast, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return. And you get repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. I think the principle is not to say ignore your family. It is don't don't ignore those around you. Don't invite people only because it's comfortable to you. Or it will bring reward to you earthly way. Look around. Let these feasting holidays be a way for you to show Christian love as Christ has welcomed you when you didn't deserve it. Romans 12, 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and show hospitality. Okay, number two. So one, pay attention to others. Pay attention to your attitudes, your ways. Number two, give attention to the meal and enjoy One way we feast is feasting is deep enjoyment in abundance and luxury. That's what feasting is. There there is a symbolic in which we give our best. I know sometimes that's just not possible given where we are in a financial situation. And hopefully we can bring somebody into our our banqueting, our feasting. Sometimes we're in a situation where we really are in a season of fasting and grieving. And God understands that. But if possible, a Christian feast gives attention to meal. I mean, look at Nehemiah. It said, get the sweet wine and the fat. And God someday will supply the riches of great fine food. God is a God that gave us these symbolic reminders that he is caring and providing and bringing pleasure. And there is a sense in which when we feast, we take these things. It might be Christmas fudge and we remember God is so rich and sweet and he is lavish towards us. God, thank you that you are. And God used food regularly as symbol to remind us of him and the ways of God. Let Give attention to meal. 
enjoy it, delight in it. I think of Psalm 36. How precious is God's love, O God. The children of man take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the rivers of delight, for with you is the fountain of light. God provides us food. May we enjoy it and remember it and delight in it. But number three, give attention to the occasion to remember and rejoice. It would be so easy. It's so tempting in American society to get together on Thanksgiving, to get together at Christmas seasons, and, and you, you eat the feast, you chat for a while, you say goodbye, and there was just no intention given to the reason why you're actually doing it. And it's to remember and to rejoice in something specific. It could be to remember that God has provided for you, will provide for you in his son and with all the wonderful things in this life. And we praise him and rejoice in him and recommit to him. Let Thanksgiving meal be a reminder that someday you will gather together because he will gather all the peoples together and they will feast and the food will be like nothing we have ever tasted and it will be so glorious and there'll be no division between people and so the fellowship will be unbelievably great and it will be from the maker and savior of our souls. Give attention to why you celebrate Christmas. Talk with your children. Read some scripture. Sing a song. Play a song maybe. Something that would be intentional and meaningful as you celebrate. Seek intentionally to do this. It takes work if you're not used to doing it. It might seem awkward and seem strange and forced. But pray that God would help you to bring into the occasions a giving attention of why we are doing this. One of the things in which God's people, the Jews, for so long would gather on the Sabbath evening, on a Friday night moving into the Sabbath, was they would gather and they would remember what God had done and provided for them. And week after week, year after year, they would remind themselves in this weekly thanksgiving to God of what He has done. And so that should happen to us. We are to remember past grace, We are to remember the deeds of the Lord like the things we'll write on our rocks on Tuesday. We are to remember his absolute amazing covenant love and faithfulness to us. And we need to remember that we are destined to a feast. That's our destiny. And the meal that we eat this Thursday or whenever you do feast is only but a foretaste of the glory delight in the Father's right hand and his presence. There is fullness of joy at his right hand. Our pleasures are forevermore. Let us sing together, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let us focus on this King. He has been raised from the dead, that is, and let us remember that God rejoices over us. The meal that you'll eat, any meal you eat, is God's provision. God is ultimately the host. And he prophesies in Zephaniah that he is the one that's in the midst and that he will come and he is the Savior. And it says that he will exult over with a loud singing his love towards us. The last thing I, I say to you here is give attention to the source and worship. I guess this is very similar to number three. But number four, give attention to the source as you sit down and you give thanks. It's possible for you to do a non-Christian Thanksgiving meal where you do a lot of thanking and you're just thanking some neutral, some lucky force of karma or whatever it is out there and not the Lord Jesus Christ. When we gather, we remember the host and provider of our party who is always Christ and we, well, feasting is kind of like a certain kind of boasting. We sit there and we raise the glass and we say, the Lord is our provider. The Lord is our shield. 
The Lord is our goodness. The Lord is our pleasure. The Lord is our salvation. The Lord is our life. The Lord is our rescuer. The Lord is everything. All that I have, it is of the Lord. We are, we are boasting when we feast. And Christians do nev- never boast in themselves. At least they are not supposed to. God told the prophet, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom or in his might or his riches, but let him, boast, let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am a Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. So Paul says, far be it from me, except I boast in anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This Tuesday, we are going to feast. We're going to feast by taking the Lord's Supper. And oh, we will eat of, of bread and juice, the bo- symbolizing the body and blood of Jesus Christ who was given for us. We will do it together. And we will remember the occasion that He is our God and our Savior forever. Christians feast because they have a father who bids them to come to a banquet table. We feast on Sundays and at the Lord's Supper and at times when he provides so mercifully in our homes together. We have a brother who paid for the meal and welcomes us into the family when at one time we were outsiders and enemies. That friend, that brother is Jesus. His table is so lavish with beauty, luxury, and abundance. And so I welcome you to that. I welcome you to that each Sunday. May we feast in his delight. Let's pray. Father, please grant us greater feasting joy didn't say much about this father but I wish I did help us to bring unbelievers in and show them that Christians really know how to feast really know how to have true joy and it's truly found in Jesus Christ pray that we would live that and we would practice it with holiday occasions like this as well. And God, I pray that if there's anyone here that has not yet come to Jesus, please, God, save them. Please bring them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you're here this morning to worship Christ. If you're visiting, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We want to get to know you. We want to know how we can help you and pray for you and help you be part of the family of God here. If that's what you need, and you don't have a church home, We are going to dismiss for about five minutes and we're going to continue worship and we ask all those that are members and if you're part of this church, even if you're technically not a member, we'd ask that you'd stay for not a long but an intentionally important meeting in which we remind ourselves of the covenant that we make to each other and then we we are going to talk about and present to you a budget for next year and have some other updates we're going to do These are important times for the family here as a church, and I hope that you can join us for that. We're going to do that right away, but we'll first dismiss. I hope that you can join us this Tuesday at 7 o'clock as we we call it our Ebenezer service. It comes from a word in 1 Samuel 7, 12, in which God's people took a rock of memorial and said, Ebenezer, which means this had a symbolism of God is my help. And it was a reminder, just as he's helped me in the past, he'll help me in the future. And we're going to remind ourselves of how he has helped us. And we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We're going to worship. And then we're going to finish with uh, feasting on some food, some pies that people bring at the very end. There is a sign up. Even if you didn't sign up or don't get to sign up, we still want you to come this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. There'll be no Wednesday night service, just the Tuesday. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. 
through Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. you are dismissed.